Okay, he said it was rough. Give me one. Fifteen. Woo -hoo -hoo! Fifteen. So we have e to the x squared y minus e to the y equals x. So what I want to do is I want to find dy dx or the rate at which x and y are changing with respect to one another. Okay. So first thing here, let's take derivative of this. What's the derivative of e to the something? So e to the x squared y. That does not change. Okay. Now what I've got to find now is the that's a nested function inside my e to the something. So I got to take that times how quickly that something is changing. And so what am I going to have to use to find the derivative of this? Product rule. So I'm going to put that in parentheses because I'm going to have two parts of it, the sum of two things. So I'm going to have 2xy plus x squared times 1 dy dx. Something. Okay. Now we're not done yet. Minus e to the y times the derivative of y is dy dx equals 1. Okay. So again, anytime you differentiate something that has a y, you're going to have to do, keep in mind how, how much y changes with respect to x, which is denoted by dy dx. So now we just got to go ahead and crank this out. I've got to distribute this to unlock this dy dx that's in there, so I can combine it with this dy dx. So what I've got is e to the x squared y. Let's go 2xy, let's put that out front, plus um, x squared e to the x squared y times dy dx minus e to the y dy dx equals 1. And now let's just scoot things around. Okay. You know, I don't know how much you guys are comfortable with skipping, but I'm going to go like this. All divided by what would be left if I had, if I pulled out a dy dx. That's what they have. I'll take a look, don't worry about it. Because you guys will. The book's tore up. 2.7, number 15. 2.8, number, yeah, that's what I was going to say, because it was 2.7, I got it wrong. I should have had um, sine, cosine, something like that. Um, 15, 1 minus 2xy, x squared y, x squared, yes. There we go. Yeah, it looks like these back two pages in my book are like some ancient sea scroll. <laughs> That's about the shape they're in. Oh my goodness. So, it gets a little delicate back. It's the most often used part of the book, I suppose. That's before they had Slater.com. Which I'm sure you guys know about, right? Anyway, so there's number 15. What else? That's it? 19. I hope I can. Okay. This one's actually more user friendly than the last one, thank goodness. Because the last one, whenever we have. Uh, product rule and chain rule and stuff, it kind of brings some ugly things into the mix. So e to the 4y, the derivative of e to the 4y is e to the 4y times 4 dy dx, because I just differentiated a y. So one way you could think about it too is anytime a, 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 um, a y disappears as far as going from y to no y or y squared to y, We've got to keep, to keep into consideration how much that's changing. Minus 1 over x, no, 1 over y dy dx equals 2. 
and I think that one we can just kind of go right to the answer now. 2 divided by, because this is all my dy dx terms over here, um, and I could pretty this up a little bit, 4 e to the 4y minus 1 over y. My guess is they probably didn't have their answer like that. Now I've got myself curious. How did they write that? They get rid of y top and bottom, maybe? Get rid of 1 over y? Yeah, that's pretty good. So what they decided was, you know what? I don't like that. So they multiply the bottom by y, multiply the top by y, and then they end up with this. Um, 2y over 4y e to the 4y minus 1. Rate of change. Okay. Anything else? 17. Okay. Okay. So you got this then. Good. Okay. The one thing here, I still put this in parentheses because, um, because um, I'm still multiplying my original um, function with the with the nested function times its derivative. So that's why I put this in parentheses. So anyway, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to have to distribute to get this dy dx kind of freed up a little bit. Okay. So if I do that. Um, let's just go, let's go like this, 1 over 2 squared of x plus y plus 1 over 2 squared of x plus y. And you could have it be the ugly thing with a negative exponent too, that wouldn't make any difference. dy dx minus 8x equals dy dx. Now I've got a term with dy dx, it's not buried inside of something else. Um, so now, now I can go ahead and collect things a little bit better. But I foresee a problem here. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this out. Um, let's go ahead and scoot that to the other side. Now what? Well, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to figure out what I have to divide by. So if I take out a dy dx, I'm left with 1 minus. The others, we've been able to kind of skip around that idea, but uh, maybe that's why I should probably show another step there on my previous problems. Okay. Um, so like say back here, what I'm really doing, I just did it in my head, I'm going dy dx, I'm taking that out of both these terms, I'm factoring it out. So that's where I had the x squared e to the x squared y minus e to the y. And that's where I got what I was dividing by. So when I factor that over here, I have this 1. That's going to be a common issue. So now, what the heck do we do from here? Well, we're going to divide. But it's going to give me something uglier than ugly.
so then I have this curiosity about, you know, there's, an al there's always this question, how far should I, how far should I simplify? So honestly, I've kind of learned in the past to check the back to kind of see if I need to simplify any more. Um, and then we can kind of challenge ourselves to match theirs. So this particular one, that is what, 17? Um, okay, they don't have a fractions within fractions, which I thought they would probably try and get rid of. So how in the heck would I get rid of my fractions that are on the top and on the bottom? What can I multiply by to get rid of my fractions? Yeah. So I multiply the bottom times 2 square roots of x plus y. I multiply the top times 2 square roots of x plus y. So if I'm multiplying the top and the bottom by the same thing, I'm really multiplying by 1. So it's not going to change my answer at all. So when I distribute this, I get 1 minus 16x square roots of x plus y all over 2 square roots of x plus y minus 1. And I think I'm liking that pretty well. They have the order on top and bottom both switch, but you switch the top, switch the bottom. It's not playing top and bottom by a negative one. That's fine. So yeah, if we, if we, anytime you have um, what's considered a, what's called a complex fraction, a fraction within a fraction, one third plus five divided by. Um, um, 6 minus 1 third, you just multiply the bottom and the top, and just so happens that we're trying to get rid of the same thing on top and bottom. So it would be 1 plus 15 over 2 minus 1, and it's a lot prettier, and then it's easier to go from there. We've killed fractions forever, so it's just, now it's like killing really ugly fractions. Those are some those are some tough ones. <coughs> Anything else? Okay, so we almost got them all done. Okay, I just grabbed my glasses and I don't have my glasses on my head. So, so I got x plus three over y equals four x plus y squared. Okay. So, right side, easy peasy. Left side, product rule. Low, d high, minus high, d low, I just got rid of a y, just divided by low squared. Okay. But what do you want to do now? Well, I can't simplify y, but honestly, what I'm thinking about right here, let's get rid of this y squared on the bottom. If we didn't have y squared on the bottom, it would be a piece of cake. So let's multiply both sides by y squared, or you can take a look at it as we're even cross multiplying. So I got y minus x plus 3 dy dx equals 4y squared plus 8y to the third dy dx. So let's collect some things. Um, again, we can do it either way. Move this over. Now since this is addition, I can just go ahead and think about those parentheses just being gone.
Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, where did I get my 8? That was dumb. Y squared times 2y. Yeah, 1 times 2 is not 8. At least not today. Okay, so um, the next part that I want to work on, um, hmm, I wonder if I could do like a couple basic ones and then get more advanced tomorrow, because I think um, having everybody here is going to be going to be better for everybody involved. Okay, well. Um, related rates. Let's get started. Related rates is also in this section very, 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 very similar to um, to um, implicit differentiation. Okay. Let's go like this. Let's start off with just a couple of examples. Let's say that the radius of a circle is growing at the rate of, let's go, two centimeters per minute. How fast is the area changing? Okay. Okay. Related rates. So basically, we have if I change my radius at a certain pace, hopefully, you guys would agree that my area is going to change as well. Do you think my area is going to change at the same pace? pace is my radius. On a circle, if I double the, the radius, do I double the area? No, I don't. So there's not a linear relationship between the two. Okay. So here's what we're going to have to do. Here's how we write this. The radius of a circle is changing at 2 centers per minute. So that would be dr, changing my radius, over time equals 2 centimeters per minute. Oh, I need to put something else. Um, how fast is the area changing when r equals 10? I need to put when r equals 10. Bless you. Bless you. So what, what I want to do now is this find, these are both important parts to write down, find how fast the area is changing. How would I write that? D, DA, DT, because how fast is the area changing with respect to time when I'm going to put a little subscript here, R equals 10. Okay, so now you'll notice that what I have here is I want to find how quickly my radius is changing with respect to my area. So I've got to write an equation for area in terms of r. Okay. What is the area of a circle in terms of r? Area equals pi r squared. Okay. So that's just how one relates to the other. r, I square it, take it times pi, I get my area. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate the left side with respect to time and differentiate the right side with respect to 
prime, okay? So, a to the first. What's the derivative of a to the first? One, okay? So it'll be one times dA dt. I just differentiated an a, so I need times dA dt. Because like yesterday, I differentiated a y, so I need dy dt. Equals, what's the derivative of two, uh, I'm sorry, of pi r squared? Two pi r, good. Two pi r times. No, what's the derivative of? Well, how could I express how far, r, how fast r is changing? It'd be dr dt. I've already successfully differentiated this, so now I'm just looking at the r, dr dt. Okay. So what this is telling me is that any time that my radius changes a little bit. It's going to tell me how quickly my, my area changes. Okay? So now let's plug in what we know. My dr dt is 2. Okay? And my r, my actual value of r, is 10. And then I have that be equal to dA dt. I don't, that's what I'm trying to find. So that stays kind of a variable, if you will. Okay. If you wanted to, you could really get concerned about your um, your units in here. So let me just show you this. I don't usually track this as I go through. This would be two times pi times ten. That's so centimeters. And this would be centimeters per minute, because that's my two centimeters per minute. So when I simplify this, I would get two, uh, two times two is four times 10, so 40 pi. And now let's look at my units. Centimeters squared per minute. Does that unit make sense? That it's growing so many square centimeters per minute? Okay, so that's kind of just an example of some of the problems we're going to go through. Let me talk a little bit more theory here, just a little bit. Okay, the, don't don't write anything down here. If I'm filling this up at a certain rate, okay, how is my dHdt going to behave? Okay, so in other words, if I'm filling this up at a constant rate. Okay, how is my height going to behave? It's going to increase, and is it going to change, or is it going to behave at a constant rate as well? Yeah, it's going to be constant, because the shape of this is constant. Because since we have a cross-sectional area that's always the same, it's going to take the same amount of water to fill up the bottom as it is the top. Okay, but if I change the shape and do something like this, and I'm putting in water. Okay. I'm putting, let's say this is constant. Is my dHd, how, describe how my height changes. As I start pouring in water, how does my height change? Yeah. So it's always going to increase, but at first it's going to increase very quickly. But as it goes on, it's going to increase more slowly. Okay, so that's why we are always going to ask: find dHdt at a certain height, because my height might make a big difference. Okay, and I could even do something like this. Well, so basically, my dHdt might look like this. It's going to increase, or my dHdt is actually going to. Mostly, how am I going to do this? So time and height. My height is going to increase very quickly at first, and then it's probably going to slow down. See what I'm saying? Okay. Um, I could also do something funky like this. I could say, what if I had some funky shaped base? Okay. Bless you. My height is going to increase 
kind of linearly and then it's going to slow down and then it's going to speed up and it's going to slow down and it's going to speed up and it's going to slow down. You see what I'm saying? It's going to slow down and it goes through the fat part because it takes a lot of area to get through there. So that's just, so just understand that, um, that the rate that something changes might need to be considered um, based upon the shape of the object, stuff like that. Oh, like rocks or something like that? Well, then, yeah, we'd have to consider that as well. But what, but, oh, that's a very good question. I like that. What if something was in the container? So let's go like this. So let's say there was a big old rock in there. So what we would have to do is we would have to consider the cross-sectional area of the area around the rock, technically. Okay? So what we'd be looking at is what is this area and how quickly the height changes would depend upon that area. Make sense? Okay, how much do we have to fill? Okay. So anyway, so um, so what if I said something like this? Um, this is kind of another famous problem. I got a building and I got a ladder that's leaning up against the building. Okay. And let's say this ladder is 20 feet tall. Okay. Um, and due to this not the, the coefficient of uh, friction not being high enough, this is actually starting to slide out. This is starting to slide out. Okay. And let's say this is creeping out slowly at about one foot. Per minute. Okay. So let's call this my x and my. Well, let's, let's, do, let's go x and h. What the heck? Okay. So this x, this one foot per minute, that would be dx dt. Because how much is my x changing? Is my x growing or getting smaller? Growing. So it'd be positive one feet per minute. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to find dh dt at, let's start off with when um, x is 4. Find dh dt when x is 4. So find out how quickly this top is moving down because if this is sliding out, well then the ladder is going to be shifting down. Okay, so you're standing on the ladder. How fast are you moving? Okay. So what do we have to do? After we write down everything, we notice we've got x and h. We need to find out a, re a way to relate h and x. Okay. A couple things I want to e emphasize real quick. This x equals four. I cannot put that in my equation. Anything that state that is a specific point in time, I can't use. I've got to find just a very general equation that relates x and y, x and h in this case. So look back at the picture. What can I do, what can I write with um, relate that relates x and h? Okay, x, h, and 20, that's true, but what equation can we write? Pythagorean theorem, so here we go. Okay, let's go x squared plus h squared equals 20. So I can't plug in this 4 yet. Mm -mm, I can't, because h can be different. So now let's differentiate. What's my derivative of x squared? 2x. Now, this is going to freak you out, but now I'm figuring out how quickly everything changes with respect to time. So I've got to take that times dx dt. Plus, what's my derivative of h squared? 2h times dh dt. What's the derivative of 20? Zero. Okay. So now what I've got is an equation where I can plug in x, dx dt, h, or dh dt, and I'm going to 
go ahead and find out how, top, how fast the top of the ladder is changing. So you can see that I want to find DHDT. So that's the only thing I'm not going to plug something in for. So the rest of it's not too bad. 2 times, well, my x is 4. My dx dt, we decided is 1, plus, ooh, I don't have an h, do I? Crap and crying and crying and what do I do? Exactly, now I can evaluate this specific situation. If this is 4, okay, then h is going to be the square root of 384. Um, just 20 squared minus 16, uh, square root of 384. Um, I think I can simplify that quite a bit. I don't have my calculator with me, so I'm not going to ask you guys help. How many times does 16 go into 384? 1, 2, 20, 16, 24, I got it. Okay, so 4 squared is 24. That's not fully simplified, so let's keep going. Two square roots of I don't know, I'm sorry. Four square roots of six squared of Come on brain, slow down. Four square roots of six square root. Did the same dang thing again. Four square root of twenty-four breaks up a new square root of four square root of six. So get eight square root of six. Okay. So my H is 8 squared to 6, dh dt. Now we can solve for dh dt, right? Yeah, this is very similar to the differentiation at this point. So dh dt equals 4, uh, let's, what the heck, let's go 8, divided by 16 squared to 6, which is 1 over squared to 6. Okay. What would my unit be? What per what? Now this is just height. It's not area like my last one. This is just height. How quickly am I? Is my height changing? It would be feet per minute. Okay. So, one thing I want to talk about here real quick is as I am pulling that ladder out at a constant rate, do you think my height is falling at a constant rate? I think it's always falling at the same rate? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We're going to find out. She says yes, you say no, let's go. So if I would did, if I would did, yeah, if I would do, say, for example, um, let's go x equals 12 instead. Okay, so we did 4, we did 12. The equation doesn't change to this point. Now I'm going to evaluate it for when x is 12. 2 times 12 plus 2 times, trust me, my height would be 16. speed is different. My speed is actually greater. Okay. 1 over 2 squared 6. Top's not moving very fast at all. You might not even notice it. But now it's going to go a lot faster. So we will work on this tomorrow because it's going to take a little bit. When we write down our information, write it down in such a fashion, and when we, when we figure out what we, what we want and what we have, that'll tell us how to relate everything. We'll work on that tomorrow. Okay, I might have you try one basic one, but we will go from there. <laughs> and every once in a while, I like seeing the comments that are left behind by the people using this book before me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, nice. <laughs> what the hell is going on? <laughs> Okay, so let's try a couple more implicit differentiation problems. 
Um, I'm going to have to choose some some evens here. Page 227. Let's do. Um, Sixteen. Yeah, so those two. And you don't have much time, so I'm not going to give you really much more. Um, try thirty-three. Three problem assignment.